Hello and welcome to the online service from Nambour Anglican Parish, South East Queensland, Australia. My name is Ralph Bowles. I'm the priest in charge of this parish in the Anglican Church, Southern Queensland. This service is a brief explanation of the Christian gospel, a brief act of worship, and we pray that in listening to it and watching it, you will find encouragement in your search for God, if you're searching for God, or in your relationship with God, if you want to express faith and hope. Here is a verse from the Apostle John to open our service today. From 1 John chapter 1. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. May God bless you today as you join your spirit with God's spirit in worship and fellowship. I'd like to uh, talk to you this morning uh, uh, on this first uh, Sunday in February as the ministry year gets going about sharing the love of Christ. We don't talk about this much, but this is a little motto that we adopted a while back for summarising what um, I hope we are about here in uh, Nambour Anglican Parish, sharing the love of Christ. And I want to particularly um, refocus for myself and for, for others, for you, the vision, if you like, of this parish, why we are here, what God wants us to do. Um, and uh, we will, uh, I'll explore a few other aspects of that over the next couple of weeks, more about that soon. Uh, so, a, a church like ours is a ministry partnership. We're here not just for ourselves, but to serve the Lord, serve the world, serve the gospel, serve our neighbours. So what's our prayer and our goal? Uh, it's an interesting question, I want to start by that. How do you pray for our church? You don't have to answer now, but how we all, each of us, praying for our ministry here. Without prayer and the Lord's answers to prayer, um, our ministry will not move ahead and not be reach its fulfilment. A lady in my last church used to, um, on our prayer team, she was on a prayer team during church services uh, on occasions, and she would, uh, there's a choir gallery, an organ gallery up the top, so she could go up the top there and pray. And she told me that she would um, look down at the empty seats in the pews and pray that they would be filled with people. That's the way she prayed every Sunday, one of the ways she prayed. I thought that was good, you might like to pray like that. Uh, and uh, another story from my previous parish, in our first service on the Sunday, like this one at 7.30 in the morning, um, um, we all sat down in the toilet and they said, we need more people, we haven't got many people here, we need. And I said, well, let's all pray. So we all started really praying for more people to we come to church, we be drawn to church, we be invited to church, and then it actually happened. It was quite wonderful, really. And I remember one of the ladies saying, we prayed about this and it's happening. <laughs> so how are we praying for our church? Let me just leave that out there for you. What is our goal and what we're trying to do? Well, there are many ways of summarizing it, but I'd like to take this prayer of St. Paul in Ephesians 3, his great prayer. I'm running a little past the prayer into chapter 4, uh, as a, a focus for this idea of loving Christ better, to know the love of Christ better. Listen to St. Paul in his great prayer. Um, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And then he finishes with a little ascription of praise. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. 
So that's his prayer, that his friends in these churches in Asia Minor, in Turkey as it were, will know, love Christ better. They'll know the love of Christ better, deep within their hearts. Now that's a great prayer, isn't it? Um, and he, he extends that idea. It's not just to know the love of Christ, but to grow in the love of Christ. Now there are many ways to sum up the mission of our church, or the mission of any church, um, but I think this is a good one. To know the love of Christ in our lives and to grow in our grasp and expression of that love. Notice what he says, that having the love, the strength of God in the inner spirit, our inner being by the spirit, that Christ may dwell more closely in our hearts, be real in our lives, and that we might have a bigger, growing understanding of the love of Christ, being filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. It's a wonderful, wonderful prayer to Paul love. Praise. So the good news of God's love for us in Christ, of God giving himself completely to us, this is the greatest message in the world. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So this love of Christ is meant to change us and change us and so we, as it were, can become agents, channels for that to um, that love to change the world. Um, so that's what I really think ministry is about, uh, to share the love of Christ together with others. The wonderful thing about this little motto, sharing the love of Christ, we share the love of Christ together in the church, but we also share it with others in word and deed uh, as God leads us. So it's both inward and uh, outward facing kind of vision this idea of the love of God, the love of Christ. So, um, now you could say that for the rest of his letter, St. Paul is really talking about this, how the love of Christ makes a difference. He talks, uh, goes on to talk about how the body of, body of Christ grows as people use their gifts and serve one another, of how we live the, the life that reflects Christ and live the new life. He says that in chapter, later chapter, chapter 4 and then chapter 5. And then, of course, how we work that out in family relationships and household relationships. And finally, how we, um, as it were, wage the Christian battle and dress ourselves in all the armour and equipment that God wants us uh, to wear to be for his service. But as I expand this, I want to expand it in a way. I know that you've probably heard me on this before, but hey, repetition is not a bad thing. It's an educational strategy. Uh, I certainly need to be reminded. Think of a diamond. Right in the heart of the diamond is, of course, Christ's love. Now, the love of Christ, as Paul says, um, the, to know how wide and large and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now, the phrase the love of Christ is, a, is an interesting phrase, grammatically. Does it mean Christ's love for us? Yes. Does it mean our love for Christ? Yes. It kind of means both, doesn't it? It's got that two-way ambiguity to it. Uh, but whatever you say, if you had to diagram St. Paul's Prayer, right in the centre of our church, right in the centre of our hearts and lives, needs to be the love of Christ. Christ's love for us and our love for him. Um, so think of a diamond. That's not a real diamond, it's just a diamond shape. But a diamond, diamonds can shine with a light that appears to come from within. In this image, this is what I'm saying. Or you might think of the cross, the great symbol of our faith. Right in the centre of the two cross beams is, of course, was Christ on the cross and is Christ's love for us on the cross uh, is the, the centre of, uh, of the message. Um, St John, the Apostle John, in his little letter, 1 John, um, talks about this, 1 John 4, he says, 9 to 10, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's, that's what we celebrate this morning in the Holy Communion. Christ offering himself for us. Now, as I've said many times, uh, for, for me it bears repeating. Religion throughout the world has, has usually been 
mainly offering things to the gods. But our faith is about God's offering to us, for us. The sacrifice we celebrate is not our sacrifice primarily, our sacrifice to God, but his sacrifice of himself for us. That's the message that turned, that turned the world upside down. So it's Christ and his love dwelling in us that, that really should glow out from our hearts and from the centre of our church. Um, so Paul elsewhere says that God has poured this love into our hearts by his spirit, through his spirit. So his prayer is that we will grow on grasping how incredible and huge this love of God is for us in the world. Um, sometimes as, uh, as the new year turns around, I ask myself the question, do I love God more now than I did last year? Or do I understand, am I in my grasp of the love of God greater? Am I uh, more filled with wonder than I was before? I think it's true to say for most of us as life goes on, things become familiar and what might have excited us years ago becomes just routine or familiar to us. And the familiarity takes away the wonder of it. So the challenge for us as Christians is to keep the wonder alive and keep growing in the wonder of God's love. Um, it, it's a great challenge to learn new things and to expand our mind. Like that phrase in the hymn, uh, lost in wonder, love and praise. What's a great line. So uh, we're called to live in this love, uh, to abide in Christ's love like branches in the vine, as our Lord said in that great parable in John 15. Now this, if this love in Christ is there, it will radiate out. And I wanted to talk about other expressions of love, the love of Christ in us. Of course, love for God. So Christ's love comes to us and lives inside us, the sense of God's love. And then it reflects back in love for God. And I put it at the top of the, di the diamond because it, it's an upward thing. If you can imagine that in the imagination. So the love of God comes down to us and lives in us and sparks our love for God in return. There's that great hymn, I think it was Charles Wesley's hymn, O Thou Who Camest From Above, the pure celestial fire to impart. Kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. There let it for thy glory burn with inextinguishable blaze and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent praise. Great theology and great poetry from Charles Wesley. So the fire of God the celestial fire of God's love for us comes down on the altar of our heart, to use the Old Testament picture. And a flame of sacred love is kindled on our own hearts. And it burns there. And then returns to the source from which it came, now in our prayers and in our praise. It's a wonderful thought. And that's what we're talking about, our love for God. The image that I often have of this and when I'm reminded of it with a little baby, and I see little babies, as you know, um, the parents and the nurturers and the family pour love into that little child and smile and laugh and stroke and feed and surround the, surround the child with smiling faces. Um, it's a wonderful thing to see it, isn't it? It's always a wonderful thing to see it. And then in time, all things going normally and well, the smile comes back. The happiness comes back from the child. Being put into the child comes back from the child. Um, and then after so many times of saying, I love you, honey, I love you, um, the little child learning to speak says, I love you, Daddy. I love you, Mummy. It comes back. And that's what we're talking about here. And our love for God came back to its source. So we we'll love the Lord our God. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, in practice, it means a lot, doesn't it? Um, it means discipleship, offering our whole lives to God, the worship of our whole life. So what we do here on Sundays and in public worship, we're doing in a concentrated way, in a, together, something that our whole life is called to do. We offer our lives 
as an act of worship, as St. Paul says in Romans chapter 12. And as we see, heard this morning in the opening words from Jesus, we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul and strength. That is a command that you and I can never fully exhaust. So it always calls us on to fully, more fully express our own response to God. Um, so our love for the Lord um, is really the most important thing. But it must also be joined to our love for one another, um, to the people around us. So this is the horizontal, if you like, movement of our love. Um, as the Lord said, the two great commandments, to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbour as yourself. So we must um, love our neighbours and love one another. So we need to a love, love for neighbours first of all. Um, this is inseparable as from the command to love the Lord our God. It's like the cross. The cross has the vertical and the horizontal. And the vertical love for God, the horizontal love for neighbours and love for others. Again, um, John in his first letter, chapter 3, really um, catches this idea. Listen to what he says, verse 16 and following. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So the love of God that we've received is meant to flow out um, in a similar kind of love for other people. This is a challenge that's always before us. Now we saw in the parable of the Good Samaritan, love for, no, love for other people doesn't restrict to just our own type of people. It's for anyone, even the Samaritans. For people of different races and colours and languages, even for our enemies. We are not excused from the obligation to love. In a, in a lovely thought in Romans 13, Paul says that the, uh, the only debt we should allow outstanding is the debt of love we owe to other people. We never pay off that debt. Romans chapter 13, great words. Um, now we could, we could call love for neighbours service and of course we have to be thoughtful about how we do it. Sometimes the neighbour in need is right near us. Someone we come across who just needs some help on the spot. Other times we have to think and look around us. What needs in our community um, could we, with God's help, do? And how can we share and help? Uh, we need to have our eyes open. Um, so we don't exist, as you know, here in our church. I know we don't. Uh, you agree with me on this. We don't exist just to serve ourselves, um, but to see whether we can help our neighbours um, be there for them. And it uh, happens, you know, just the other day, I was able to take some fruit parcels to um, a young couple in, um, nearby in our parish district who were just um, needing some food and some help. And we do that cheerfully, try and help. And then, of course, love for one another. The old uh, uh, motto, charity begins at home, means this. Love, that's what charity is, begins at home. Begins in the fellowship of the family and the family of God. Um, so the Lord, the Lord God loves the church, and so should we. Um, in Ephesians 5, St. Paul talks about how Christ loves us with all our blemishes. You know, um, and uh, so 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 we should love the church. I've I've been a little uh, less than patient over the years with uh, critics of church life and churches, because I've, I've I've observed myself. Look, you know, it's not big news that Christian people hurt each other. It's like, sure we do. Sure we fall down. Sure we're fallible. Yes, the church has its blemishes. This is not an astonishingly shocking thing. Sad though it is, it's what we would almost expect to be the case. But my, my point has often been, Jesus Christ loves us just the way we are. Isn't that a good thing? <laughs> I'm glad that that's the case. So if he loves the church, you and me, even with our blemishes, 
What right does each of us have to not love the church and our fellow Christians, even with our blemishes? And uh, I, I, uh, I've delivered that challenging response so many times over the years. Yes, of course we let each other down. Of course we are challenging to love. But Christ loves us, so we should love one another. Um, we also call, of course, to help each other grow in love and holiness. We'll read Ephesians 5 about that. A lot of stuff there. Again, um, the cross-shaped love of God um, should reflect in our love for fellow believers. So I'm saying, go back. I'll go back to First John chapter three again, um, verse eleven. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. He says, and then verse sixteen. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down His life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters and down to verse 23 this is his command to believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and to love one another as he commanded us the aged John writing these letters was at pains to emphasize the need for Christians to be a loving fellowship together and uh, he does say here in a wonderful thought that when, when we love one another, the love of God is perfected in us. I'm trying to find it here, and I've lost where the reference is. It's in 1 John 3 somewhere. 10, 11, and 12. Oh, you can find it. Read the letter of John. It's not very long, and you'll find my reference. He says the love of God. When we love one another, the love of God is perfected within us. It comes to its fulfillment. It's wonderful. Um, love one another in the body of Christ. Now, uh, I've talked about this at other times, and I, as I uh, mentioned in another sermon, I asked myself a while back, what are the duties we owe one another in the, and to love one another? What are the duties we owe one another? Well, you could probably, there's probably a long list of them, but I can think of five important duties that Christians have towards fellow Christians in the church. First of all, to encourage one another, Secondly, and not in order of importance, to pray for one another. Thirdly, to serve one another, as we do, where we need help. To forgive one another. And to make peace with each other. To be peacemakers with each other. So there are five that I think are five duties of fellowship as we, um, as we seek to love one another. In the next part of Ephesians, as you know, St. Paul goes forward to talk about uh, ministering with the gifts God's given us, to build each other up um, with the gifts that God and Christ has given the church. That too is how we love one another, we minister to one another with the gifts that God has given us. But there is yet more. And one final thing to mention today, um, and I put it at the bottom of the, of the diamond, just uh, not because it's down the bottom and important, but if you like, it is, as it were, reaching down um, to lift people up towards God, to love people who are lost from God. You know, the Lord, as we know, has a heart for lost sheep. He really is interested in people not in the church, <laughs> as many of us weren't. Um, he's looking for them, searching for them like lost sheep. Some of them don't know they're lost. The really lost ones don't know they're lost. Some people know they're lost from God and start seeking Him, but most of them don't know they're lost. Um, and uh, He's commissioned us, hasn't He, to be messengers of His love for the world. Now, the world is not interested in the church anymore, fair enough, but the church needs to be interested in the lost world. And elsewhere to the Corinthians, Paul talks about how the love of Christ grips us and we want to be ambassadors for Christ. So now reaching, reaching the world, that's, uh, that's a big thing. Um, I want to say something just in, as I close in a minute. So let's just sum this up. There's more of the love of Christ to be experienced than we've yet done. There's more of the powerful love of Christ, God for us, in us and through us that we've yet seen. He says that in that marvelous praise. Now to him who is able to do, he says, immeasurably more than all we ask. Think of your biggest prayers. 
but you're not asking enough. Think about what you would like God to do. Expect more. We, we, we ask for too little. God is able to do far more than we can even imagine. In fact, he's able to do immeasurably more than everything we can imagine. He's really pushing us to expand our vision. Um, so we should have some big prayers for God and big hopes to see the, the love of God at work. So just to sum up here, love the Lord your God, that's worship and discipleship. Love our fellow church members, that's fellowship, and let's make that stronger. Love our neighbours and serve them, as we do, I know we do here in this parish, but let's do, do more as we're able to. And um, let's love the lost people. Now, the word, the word uh, we often use is evangelism, which frightens the life out of church people. Lots of people have a reaction to the word evangelism. It's just the word gospel, with good news in it. But if you don't like evangelism, what about angelism? Angel being a messenger. <laughs> Messengers and ministers of God's love. When I went around on my diocesan job, I, I had to talk to Anglican churches in our diocese about evangelism, and I'd always get a, kind of, a bit of a reaction, well, we don't like evangelism. So I started talking to them, would well, you like being an angel of God's love? Being a messenger, blessing other people? Yes, they said, we like that. I said, well, forget about evangelism, let's just talk about angelism. Angelism is just what the same thing's about. Messengers and ministers of God's love. So I leave you with these two, uh, two thoughts just uh, to, for you to think about. For you individually and for us as a church, which of, which of these four facets of Christ's love going out needs to grow more in us than in our church? Think about it. And a personal question. How is your angelism going? <laughs> How's God using you and me to touch and help the lives of lost people? May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ. Amen.
Thank you for watching this video. We hope it's been of encouragement to you for your spiritual life. If you'd like what we produce here, please subscribe to this channel. That'll be a great help to our ministry. And if you want to support us financially uh, by a donation, you can do so in the link below this video. Uh, and that donation goes through our website. Thank you for watching again. And we pray that you'll be encouraged in your understanding and knowledge of God. So thank you very much for being with us.